Yes, it's not a typo. 15 million plus users. That probably is the cap. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Ben. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking to you about how I created this audio show, some of the problems I faced and these kind of things. So going more into the agenda, talk about what it was I was making and uh, and why. And then I'll talk more about sort of the functionality. So the user interaction and some of the edge cases that are good to think about for this uh, this audio show. Some of the challenges I faced and more specifically the sort of automatic opening, so the polling for this audio show. The state management, how I specifically managed the state for, for this, this feature, how I consumed the audio data as well, and how this was done natively. And then we'll take a quick look at, at some of the code and a little demo of an audio show that I've mocked out. So yeah, going into the audio show, what actually was it? You know, why was I doing this? And it was, it was basically a feature on a companion app for a large sporting event, which meant that you know we had 15 million plus users like all so so many users as i said that was probably the cap it was probably around two to three million most of the time but that's still a lot of a lot of users and a lot of requests to manage also it was a multilingual app so i can't remember exactly how many but there were probably about you know 10 plus locales that we had to manage I won't be going into this, but it's just worth mentioning. So yeah, what should this audio show do? And, and what is it? What does it look like? First and foremost, it should play an audio track. It's, you know, you want to press play and you want to hear a track. It could be music. It could be a podcast, something happening live or something just hosted on a server somewhere. We should be able to see our, our track name and description, just information for the users. And from a more interactive point of view, we want to be able to play stop and close the audio show and some of the constraints on this project that i had so this audio show was only accessible in english so we need to think about you know we only want to display it when our devices language is set is in english and we also don't want to melt the server that we're uh, we're accessing right so as i said up to 15 million users or, or maybe more that's a hell of a lot of requests. We we don't want to we don't want to be smashing a server with that and just burn it out. And then finally, the a user should be able to hear the audio show after a maximum of 30 seconds. And that's because with this audio show in particular, there was a 30 second gap at the beginning where there'd be music playing. <clears throat> after that, we actually get into the meat of the audio show. So that's that's when we want the users to be able to hear what's going on. So with those in mind, I'll talk about some of the, the functionality of the audio show. And this, this might be quite simple, but it's, it's good to think about. So opening the audio show, we've got two different ways of doing it. The first of which is manually. And you can split this up too. So one of them's in the app. You, know, you press a button which says, open my audio show, it's live or whatever. Or a deep link, we have a notification sent through to the phone. You press on the notification, it opens up the app, and we see our audio show. And the second of which is automatically or automatically. While we're, we're using the app, if the audio show goes live, we want the user to be able to see it. Let's, let's talk about how we actually uh, do these things or some of the things we need to think about when doing these things. So manual opening, definitely the simpler of the two. So you press your button, the audio show comes up. And your edge cases, what happens if you press a button when your audio show is not live? You need to show that the audio show isn't live to the user. Plus the constraint that we have on language, we want to say your, your language is not English so that they know they can't access the audio show. Obviously, this will be translated into the language that they have on their device. The, the second of these opening methods, which is probably the, the more interesting one to think about, was the automatic one with polling. So just very briefly, polling, if you don't know, is just doing requests in you know, X time increments repetitively. So yeah, this was the architecture that we used for our, our audio show. We had our app, which is the front end. We had our, a cache server and a back end that costed per request. Cache server was sort of a dedicated server for just hosting the audio show metadata um, or not if it wasn't live. So how this actually worked, the cache server every second would be or would be polling every second to, to see if the audio show was live. 
If it wasn't live, that's fine. The cache server doesn't hold any information. Then some external functionality updates the audio show being live in the back end. Now, next time the cache server polls or the next second, it grabs the audio show live data. Now the live data is in the cache. So how do we get this onto our app? We get the audio show every 30 seconds. So that's times 15 million, because we could have 15 million users. That's a hell of a lot of, a lot of requests. If it's not live, then obviously we don't get anything. If it is live, we get the audio show. The interesting part about this is just why did we have this cache server in the first place? So that one of the reasons is the cost. You know, if we're doing 15 million requests every 30 seconds, we'd be doing 30 million requests a minute compared to 60 requests a minute. Also, this is a hell of a lot more scalable. So if we have a dedicated cache server, that server only has to deal with the requests from the phone and for the audio show. Whereas this backend is for our entire application, for all the other functionality, we could get blocking and, and you know melt our server, as I mentioned. Yeah, we, it's good to think about what could go wrong with this polling. And this is more from the point of view of doing the request. And the first one is obviously language. We only want to get the audio show. Our device's locale is English. That's an easy one. We can just check the um, locale on the device before we start the polling or do the polling at all. And another one to think about is what if it's already been opened and then the user has pressed the, the close button, but our polling is still happening in the background. So we don't want to reopen and reshow the audio button. So basically we, we, we say, you know, when we're receiving data from our request, which happens every 30 seconds, we only want to update the, the, the state or the, you know, whether the audio show is, is showing or not, if there isn't already data in the state. And this is because when the audio show isn't live, the state is empty, right? So I guess this leads on nicely to the state management for the application. This is kind of how I manage the state. Obviously, there's different ways to do it. But if we just sort of say our audio show data is coming from the back end, that would be our cache server. It's coming into our app. We, I chose to use Redux um, to store this, uh, mainly because the, the rest of the application was actually using Redux, but we created a nice uh, audio show slice. This then fed into an audio show context, which was kind of the sole source of truth for our audio show, which meant that any component that needed to use the audio show data, metadata, which is title and description, only needs to access this data from the audio show context. And then, of course, we have our React Native track player, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it's, it's the part that helps us consume our audio data and give us native controls for play and stop. That, that can be contained within the context as well and therefore forwarded to components or consumed by components that need it. So yeah, a little bit more about the Redux. Why did we actually use Redux? It just made it really nice to be able to store the audio show metadata from the back end. And yeah, th this was the type that we used for our audio show. So you can see it's pretty simple. And, you know, we can have our initial state. So when the app initializes before it's polling or anything, we always have an empty audio show and we can signify you know, to the user that it's an error or it's, it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't exist. And when our audio show populates, that's kind of what the data would look like there. We also have a state in Redux for our opening method. And this probably seems a little bit weird because I usually can just press a button and open the audio show, right? But this, is mainly for, you know, if the user is pressing a button and trying to open the audio show when it's not live, we want to show an error message. But we don't want to show this error message or toast when, when we have the audio show not live from the polling or the automatic opening method. Hence, we always switch to auto so we don't show an error message. And as soon as they press a button in the app, we switch to the manual opening method, show the error message, switch back to auto. So yeah, a little bit more on the audio show context, why we actually used it. As I mentioned, it's sort of a single source of truth for the audio show. So we can expose everything that we need to expose to all of the components that consume things about the audio show. Interacts with both Redux and the track player. So sort of linking back to the single source of truth, everything you need for the audio show is contained within 
the, uh, the context. And we can contain all of the business logic for our audio show in this context. So this is an example of the opening method that I was just talking about. So yeah, we can switch to, to manual show and show an error message and then switch back to auto. And then finally, I guess, consuming the audio data. Uh, so talking more about the, the React Native track player and why I actually decided to use that. So it has an easy to use API, as you can see from some of the code there, uh, it was just three random lines, but it's, it's pretty obvious what that's doing. We have remote events. So this package sort of really nicely managed the native side of the, uh, of the audio plane. It, it, it didn't try and do some sort of hacky JavaScript way of playing the audio, audio through that. It would actually use the native audio players. Hence, you could use background audio, put the app in the background and have the audio still playing. And another sort of small one was the track types. So you could define which type of track was being consumed to React Native track player. And this was useful because we were actually using HLS. So because it was a live stream of an audio show, you can tell React Native track player that this is the kind of data that's consuming and that will work properly natively. If you don't define that properly, it just crashes. Let's move on to the, the code and, and the demo and have a look at, at some of that. First of all, I will take a look at the code and then I'll, um, I'll move over to sort of giving a little demo of, of the app and how that works. As you saw, we have the audio show type. So this is everything that will expose from our context. By the way, this is our audio show provider. So this is our context. We have the initial value. So it's pretty standard stuff. And we create a little hook for consuming the audio show. It's a little bit easier. We've got a bit of setup. It's useful to see that, you know, we, we, wait, we wait for the buffer there. This was a little, a little bug we had and didn't know how to solve for a little while. <laughs> But yeah, it's a bit nicer being able to, to wait for the track to buffer ahead of time a little bit. Also the capabilities. So this is what we can actually do with the React Native track player. And this is what we can do remotely. So we could add pause or other things, but these were just the functionalities we needed. And moving on to the actual provider. So uh, you can see that we access, you know, the playback state from the, this is from the React Native track player. We have data from the, from Redux, and we can sort of derive the, the live and playing, uh, is playing states from, from this information. This was this little use effect about the, you know, manual auto opening methods, whether it's polling or the user has pressed the button and showing this, this host error message. This is probably, this is quite interesting as well. So after we've actually registered our remote events on our app start, we want to consume those remote events and, and make sure that we actually, yeah, react to them. So this is just a remote stop, pretty, pretty simple looking code, but it's useful to know. We have a play and stop methods on our store and finally returning our provider. So we can wrap that around any components that we need. Uh, to consume that information. So yeah, this is pretty much the meat of everything we need for our audio show. Obviously we've got our components that are just styled and rendered and consume functions and data from this. So I've sort of mocked out uh, a go live button. Obviously this would happen if the audio show was being polled for, but uh, yeah, if I just click this here, you can see the audio show appears and we have some of our functionality. If I close and reopen, we can still open up our audio show. I'll play a track. Hopefully it's not too loud, actually. We have our audio show still playing. I can actually hear the music. <laughs> so I was just going to do a little demo of how we can actually close or put the app in the background. We have our audio show playing natively sort of in the background. We can, we can stop this. It won't just yet. So if we go back to the audio show, you can still see it's playing. We have a nice little lotty animation. If I stop this remotely, we can see that the audio show stops and disappears. That is still online as we can open it back up. If we go offline, it stops. And if I try to open it, we get a little notification saying the audio show is not live. So 
yeah, that's that's sort of a little demo, and that's some of the code. I can try and submit some of the code back up to GitHub for you guys, so that you can take a look at some of the other components and how they consume that that information from the context. So yeah, let's go over a little recap of, of what I presented to you guys and what, what we've looked at. So I think an important thing about this is is why I was building it and. I guess it's mainly because of the number of people that we're, we're going to be using this. You know, 15 million plus people is, is a lot of users. We've, we've talked about some of the constraints and, and capabilities, some of the things we, we should think about when designing and building something like this. Also talked about how not to melt a server, right? So uh, a little architecture that, that you can think about and set up um, so as not to destroy your, your server. Uh, we've, we've talked about organizing the state for the audio show. So that's mainly revolving around the, the audio show provider to the context. And we've take, taken a look at some of the code. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope uh, some of that was interesting for you. Thank you very much.